The twelve, ten plus two, labors of Heracles, whom the Romans called Hercules. I gave you the Greek word for labors there, that was usually translated as labors. It comes from the same source as our English word athlete, contest. That's what the word athloi means, the twelve contests of um, Heracles. He is ordered to give to do ten labors, but then two of them aren't accepted, and so he has to do a total of twelve. The start of the story. Don't panic when you see this slide. You're not going to need to know more than three of these names. You probably guess which ones. Which ones would you need to know? Zeus, Hera, and Heracles. Zeus, Hera, and Heracles. If you got that far, you're okay. So don't panic, okay, with all these all these names. So I just put them up there so that you can um, get them down in your notes and you can have the story for yourself but, and see what it is that I'm saying. It starts off with Amphitry Amphitryon and Alcmena. They are a married couple. Amphitryon is... Uh, Perseus's grandson. I haven't told you about Perseus yet, but you're going to see a video on him next week. He kills Medusa, a Gorgon, a woman who's got snakes for hair. And uh, uh, so he's, uh, so Amphitryon is Perseus's grandson. Okay. It's a long story. You don't need to worry about the long story. But Alcmena, uh, her, her brothers are killed. And so Amphitryon, who's a king, okay, both these people are kings, they uh, are their king and queen. Uh, Amphitryon goes to war, and uh, Alcmena says that she won't have sex with him until he brings revenge to the family, so that he's a revenge her, her brother's death. So Amphitryon goes off to war. He fights in the war, um, and he wins, and he's on his way home. Zeus sees that Amphitryon is on his way home, and Alcmena is an attractive woman, and she's so beautiful and wise. She's, she's wiser than any woman who's ever lived, something like that. And um, so Zeus, scuzzy old Zeus, disguises himself as Amphitryon, her husband. And he comes home, and he says, Honey, I'm home, and I've won the war, and told her all these exploits that he's done. And so um, immediately they fall into bed with each other. Zeus has convinced the sun and the moon to stand still for three nights, for three days. As all night long, they make love, for actually for three days, they make love. And then Zeus leaves. Amphitryon comes home, comes into the bedroom, and there's his wife all asleep and uh, uh, groggy and exhausted. And Amphitryon wakes her up, and she says, oh, it's so good to, to have you back home. Tell me again about, about um, all, the, all your adventures during the war. And he says, I just got home. And she says, we made love all, night, all last night. It felt like three days worth of lovemaking. And after trying, I know there's a big hullabaloo about what's going on here. And finally, they figure out uh, what's happened. Well, Heron learns about this. You can't keep much secret from Heron, right? But she waits for nine months. And, uh, and she keeps an eye on the situation. And just as Alcmina goes into labor, then um, she sends Alethea, Hera sends Alethea to uh, Alcmena's house. Alethea, you probably don't remember because I didn't put a lot of stress on it, is one of Zeus and Hera's children. Children. She's one of those daughters who doesn't sh sh play a major role in things. She's the goddess of childbirth. And so Alethea goes home and, uh, or goes to Alcmena's home, sits outside the room where Alcmena is, going, is just going into labor, and she, she sits in a chair and she crosses her legs. The symbolism there should be obvious. Okay. She's not going to let Alcmena give birth. All right. Meanwhile, Hera goes to Zeus, and uh, without revealing what's going on, she, he makes, she makes him uh, swear on the river's sticks. That, um, uh, she, she makes him to get, but she talks him into making a promise that uh, the next descendant of Perseus who is born will become a great king. And Zeus says, sure, because he's got one of these sons who's um, just about to be born, who's Perseus's great grandson, okay? And so he says, uh, sure, I'll, I'll promise. Um, uh, meanwhile, Hera keeps uh, Al Alcmena in labor until another of Perseus's uh, grand great grandsons is born, and that's a guy named Eurystheus. He's going to be a major player in the story. I'm not sure you're going to need to remember his name for the rest of your life, but he's going to end up being a major player. 
And so she's tricked Zeus into uh, making this agreement, and so Aristheus is going to grow up and become a great, powerful king. We'll get to him. Like I said, he's going to play a major role in the story when we get to it. Um, so anyway, um, um, uh, Aletheia is sitting outside the delivery room, and uh, uh, Galanthia, you don't have to her, need worry about her name at all. She's a servant. And she comes out, and she notices this woman who's been sitting there for days and days and days with her legs crossed. And she says, I'll bet that's Aletheia. And so she comes out, and she says, yay, a baby's been born. And Aletheia is so surprised, she jumps up. And when she jumps up, she uncrosses her legs, and two babies come out of Alcmina's womb. One of them, I thought I had the name up here. It was named Alcides. He's going to be named Hercules later. We'll get, we'll get to that later. Okay. And the other is a twin boy, Iphicles. Everybody tries to figure out what's been going on here. Um, but uh, one of these ch children, they finally figure out one of these children is the son of Zeus, who's played that n mean, nasty trick. And the other is going to be the son of Amphitryon, the, um, the, the husband of Alcmena. As a, minor as a minor story here, some stories have that baby Alc Alcides, let me put that up here so you can at least see what it is I'm saying. That's the name that Heracles is given when he's born. I'm throwing a whole bunch of names at you, don't panic, you're not going to have to learn all these names, okay. Um, that uh, um, at some point Athena, who would be Heracles' half-sister, right, because Athena is a child of... Zeus, okay, she uh, sneaks down to Earth and she takes baby uh, um, Alcides, who's going to be Heracles, up to Mount Olympus and, um, uh, and, and gives him to Hera and says, will you nurse this little baby I found? And Hera takes the little baby, Hercules, and, and begins to nurse the baby, but the baby is so strong that the force of the sucking of the infant on her nipple is so painful, she takes her, the baby away and she squirts milk across the sky. And that's where the Milky Way came from. Yeah, right. I don't believe it either. It's a little strange. Okay. Well, um, eight months go by, and Hera sends two snakes to kill the little boys because she doesn't know which one is Zeus's son and which one is Amphitryon's son. Nobody's figured it out yet. But they're going to now because in the middle of the night, these two snakes sneak into Heracles' uh, cradle, into the cradle where both the twin boys are. And uh, uh, Iphicles uh, curls up in the corner and starts screaming, and Heracles grabs the snakes and strangles them, and his one in each hand strangles these two snakes, an eight-month-old. Yeah, right strangles these two snakes and now okay now everybody knows which one is Zeus's son it's the one who grabbed the two snakes and killed them and um, they decide the the parents decide to uh, change this little baby's name to Heracles which literally means as you can see here the glory of Hera it's a way of trying to bribe Hera to be nice to him and not uh, be mean to him uh, but as you're going to see it doesn't work well Heracles grows up Amphitryon adopts him as his own son, uh, gives him a good education, which is more than just learning um, academic things. But he is trained in chariot racing and archery and especially music. Heracles' music teacher is Linus. Linus is a relative of Orpheus. You might remember Orpheus. He's the guy who played the lyre and um, made Hades and Persephone realize how heartsick he was about uh, losing his wife. Well, Linus is a relative, and he's inherited the same musical traits, I guess. Okay. And Linus is teaching Heracles uh, music. At one point, um, Heracles is misbehaving, and Linus slaps him to get his attention, and Heracles responds by killing Linus. A bit maybe of an overreaction. Here we see something about Her Heracles. He has homicidal tendencies. Can you identify with Heracles a little bit? Have you ever had homicidal thoughts? To kill a teacher, no. Not to kill a teacher, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have you ever thought to yourself, oh, I'd like to kill that? And you're really like, some people just deserve to die. 
Yeah. But no, okay, because what you do is you control those things, right? Hopefully, right? You control those things, all right? Um, but Heracles, um, yeah, I mean, he's going to kill a whole bunch of people. We want to see a pattern developing here, okay? Heracles uh, kills Linus. Now, this is a pattern that we're going to see throughout Heracles' life, okay? Um, Heracles can react in a couple of different ways. He's a big guy. He's bigger than everybody else around. He's terribly strong. He doesn't really have to worry about uh, Linus' family retaliating all that much. I mean, Linus' family shows up and says, we're going to beat you up for killing Linus. He's just going to say, so what? Do something to me. What are you going to do to me? You know, I dare you. Instead, he takes a different attitude. And his attitude throughout the story says, I've done something wrong. I want to make up for it. I want to atone for it. So we're going to see this pattern quite a bit. He'll do something that's horrible. Then the next thing you see is he admits it. And then there's some form of atonement. So in this case, he's sent off to the mountains to live alone and be a shepherd. That's his punishment. He has to leave the palace and go off and, and live as a shepherd. And while he's doing his shepherding thing, uh, he's being in, in exile, you see, for killing, for killing Linus. Um, uh, during that, that, this thing, he kills a lion. Now, this is not the lion that's part of his labors that we're going to come to, okay? But uh, the lion's been terrorizing flocks and the other shepherds around. And so um, he doesn't only benefit himself because he's a shepherd, but everybody around him who, who lives in that area and who works with sheep in that area benefits as well. Um, and this is typical of the way that this pattern works, okay? It's, it's, uh, it's a very human quality of Heracles. He does something wrong, um, he shows regret for it, and then he atones for it in a way that benefits not only himself, but uh, all of mankind, okay? All of humanity, at least in a local area, is benefited by what Her Hercules does. And we're going to see this pattern repeated in Heracles' life. While Heracles is a, a shepherd, uh, Apollo... Apollo is Heracles' half-brother, too, right? Because he's Zeus's son as well. He comes to visit Heracles, and he gives him uh, a bow and arrow. And these arrows are magical because they always hit their target. These arrows never miss. They're like guided missile arrows. Okay, they never miss. Um, also, while he's a shepherd out there, he does something else that gives you some insight into his character. And this involves a king. The king has 50 daughters, which is an awful lot of daughters to have. This is a king named Thespius. Thespius has 50 daughters. Better have more than 50 dollars if he has 50 daughters. He knows about Heracles. He knows who Heracles' father is. And his thinking goes like, uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice to get his bloodline into my bloodline? If I had kids with Zeus's grands, if I had kids in my family, not him having kids, okay? If I had kids in my family with, uh, who were grandchildren of, of Zeus, what would that do? It's like marrying into the Kennedy family or the Trump family or something like that. You know, if you marry into these powerful families, then you'll have all these benefits that come along with it. So what Thespius does is he invites Heracles to come stay in the palace. He gets Heracles rip-roaring drunk, and then um, he has him impregnate all 50 of his daughters. One story says this is all on the same night. Another story is that it's in 50 successive nights he gets rip-roaring drunk. And in the second version, Heracles doesn't know what's a different daughter every night. He's so drunk he thinks it's the same daughter that he's falling madly in love with when it's one by one. He, he impregnates these 50 uh, daughters and, and that starts a whole other line of descendants that we'll be running into later in the semester. Well, here he shows another kind of prowess, right? Some kind of sexual prowess and excellence and ability. Um, so he shows prowess against beasts here, okay? He's just uh, off the charts. Also, while he sh he's shepherding, he benefits uh, the city of Thebes. Thebes is going to show up uh, uh, next, next week. We'll say a lot about Le Thebes. But it's a city in Greece. They've been attacked by another city. They have to pay tribute to that city. They lose the war, so they have to pay the tribute. And um, he's able to fight the enemy and get Thebes off the hook. And so the king of Thebes, who's a guy named Creon, he's not up there, don't even worry about him, marries uh, Heracles off to his daughter, or marries his daughter off to Heracles. That's a woman named Megara. And Heracles is a great husband. He and Megara have um, eight kids. 
He takes care of the kids. He's interested in his family. He supports his family really well. He's a good husband. He's a very good husband. But then one day, look, don't forget about Hera. Okay? Hera is going to take revenge on the descendants of Zeus who are born out of Zeus's messing around. Hera says this isn't going to continue, so she zaps him with madness, with insanity. And he does the second worst thing you can do in ancient Greece. The worst thing you can do is kill your parents. He kills his children and his wife. He believes they're wild animals who have broken into his house, and so he slaughters his whole family, and then um, Hera yanks the madness away. And he's standing there in the house. He's covered with blood. He's, uh, bl the blood of guilt is just covering him what he's, what he's, do what he's done. He's murdered his wife and eight kids. So how is he going to atone for this? Um, he doesn't know what to do for a while. He um, c considers suicide. But then he goes to consult the oracle at Delphi. Do I have a slide for that? I don't think I put one in. Yes, I did. Yay. The Delphic oracle. I've posted a short video um, by Dr. Neiman, who's um, long since uh, passed away, but a uh, fascinating guy, a very intelligent guy. You'll get that. Maybe six minutes he talks about the Delphic Oracle and what, what goes on there. In short, Delphi is a place that um, was considered sacred to the Greeks. It was considered the, the belly button of the world, the navel of the world, the center of the world. Uh, Zeus had wanted to find out where the center of the earth was, and so he put, uh, he put birds at all the corners of the of the of the of the you know, surrounding the world and had them fly to one place and where where all those lines crossed was the center of the world and that was at Delphi and he put a huge stone there um, there's a long story about this but uh, Zeus gives Apollo this place as a as a gift um, Apollo wants uh, to build a spe something special here but there's a big scary snake who um, um, that's right python who um, is terrorizing the community around there. So he kills Python. He shoots him with a bow and arrow. And then does anybody remember what happens next to Apollo after he kills Python? He gets shot by Cupid. Well, he makes fun of Cupid. That's right. He makes fun of Cupid. He gets shot by Cupid. And then we have the Daphne story. Okay. But um, eventually, and he'll talk about this more in that. It's only like five minute video, but um, it's got some insight into what goes, goes on. There's um, a natural vent coming out of the Earth's crust there. And so a priestess would sit on top of a stool in that kind of smoky stuff, whatever the chemicals were um, that were coming out of the earth, and then um, just say a bunch of weird stuff. And then the priests would interpret what she says and, and uh, tell, tell the, the, what, what's really going to happen. Okay. So he goes to uh, Delphi. He consults the oracle. He asks what to do. And... Um, the oracle tells him that if he, he has to atone for what he's done by uh, fulfilling, fulfilling ten labors. But two of them that he does won't, aren't going to be accepted, so they end up being a total of twelve. And um, the oracle tells him he has to go to Eurystheus, who is the king of Mycenae. Mycenae, Mycenae I can't know that through me. Eurystheus. Eurystheus was that cousin of, Heracl of Heracles who's born... Uh, before Heracles, so he becomes a powerful king, just like Zeus promised. And Eurystheus doesn't like Heracles, because Heracles is a threat to him, political threat. So you can imagine the kind of labors that Eurystheus is going to, to give him. What's he going to do? He's going to give him missions that are impossible, that are going to put, bring him into conflict with gods. Um, And so the way to atone for the death of his wife, the murder of his wife and children, is to perform these labors for Eurystheus. Eurystheus is the comic relief in the story because he's terrified of Her Heracles and he's terrified of everything that, that Heracles does. Well, he sets off on these labors, these contests. The first labor is to kill a lion named the Nemean Lion. He's a lion, so he's already scary. But his, his skin is impenetrable. So you're not going to be able to use your bow and arrow on him. You can't use a spear. You can't use a sword or a knife. There's no way to pierce his, his skin. So uh, Heracles is given the job of killing this lion. And Heracles thinks about it and thinks about it. The only thing he can think to do is to wrestle the lion until he kills the lion. He's going to, he's going to have to come down to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Okay. 
And so he, he wrestles the lion, he kills the lion, um, but he looks at the dead body of the lion and he says, man, it'd be nice to have that fur. And nothing can pierce, nothing can get through. But um, how's he going to skin the lion? He can't use a knife because he can't penetrate the skin. So he takes the, the claws of the dead lion and uses them to slice open the skin. And he takes the skin off and he scrapes the meat off the inside and cures. Does it cure the skin? Turn into leather. Yeah, turn it into leather. Is that cure? Tan? Yeah, tan, 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 whatever he does to it. You know what I'm talking about. That's why you'll often see depictions of uh, Zeus with this uh, sk lion skin draped across his back because he can't be attacked from behind. Nobody can sneak up on him and stick a knife in his back or um, uh, shoot him from behind with a bow and arrow. Here you see a club carved from an, oak, from an olive tree, not an oak tree, an olive tree. That's another kind of symbol of Heracles. He carries around that club. He likes to use that club. He's got his bows and arrows that never miss the club, and then he's got this... Uh, almost like a coat of armor that he carries around with him. You can see the head where he's, he's got it like a, like a hat, kind of funny. Well, the second labor. The second labor is the, the, the Lernaean Hydra. A Hydra is like a multi-headed snake. Um, Snakes and dragons. I mean, any self-respecting hero has to kill a dragon at some point. I know snakes aren't dragons; they're different mythical, they're different animals. But you got to kill one of these big, slimy, creepy snakes, snake-like creatures to be a big, a real hero or a real heroine. You have to, you have to take care of a snake. I hate snakes. There are three kinds of snakes that I absolutely hate. The first are snakes that can kill you. The second are snakes that can't kill you. And the third are sticks that look like snakes. <laughs> Here's the three types of snakes that I hate. Okay. Well, this one, this snake has a particular gift. When you cut off one head, he grows another one to, another one to replace it. There's a, there, yeah, he grows two heads. That's right. He grows two heads. So he's got like one immortal head, and then all his other heads keep popping out when, he's, when Heracles is trying to, um, to cut off the heads. He's being assisted here by, I guess that's Heracles. doesn't really matter, does it? He's being assisted by his nephew, his brother's son. Um, anyway, finally, uh, they figure out a plan that um, uh, Heracles is going to chop off the snake's head, and then the, uh, the nephew is going to come along with a redhead iron, hot iron and cauterize the, the stump of the head so it doesn't grow up too. And then finally they narrow it down to the immortal head. He chops off the immortal head and he buries the immortal head. So that's what you do with immortal heads if you ever find one. You bury it. But before he leaves, he dips his arrows in the blood of the hydra. Uh, and the, the, the hydra's uh, blood is poisonous. Okay, so now he dips his arrows into the blood of the of the Hydra, and now he's got poisonous guided missile arrows, right? Because Apollo gave him special arrows that never miss, so he's got these poison-dipped, poison-tipped guided missile arrows. Um, and so he returns and tells Eurystheus, uh, his cousin, who's the king of Mycenae, what he's done. And um, remember, Eurystheus wants to get Heracles out of the picture. Now he's defeated two of these big, scary monsters. And so the next kind of labor, uh, the next labor is kind of different. This is the labor of the Kyrenian deer. The Kyrenian deer is sometimes called the golden hind, H-I-N-D. A hind is an old-fashioned name for a, f a female deer. This is a special kind of deer. It's got golden horns, and it's sacred to Artemis. I haven't been drilling you on these gods today. Who's Artemis? God of hunting, animals, virginity, Apollo's sister, that's, that's right. What do the Romans call her? Diana, okay. What's her symbol? Bow and arrow, okay. Both Apollo and Artemis are good archers. We'll get to a story about them at some point being archers. Um, 
The threat isn't that the deer itself is all that dangerous, although there's something about if, their hor if her horns scratch you, you, if her antlers scratch you, you get to sickness or something like that. If I forget, it doesn't really matter. But he's not supposed to kill it anyway. Um, he's supposed to catch it and bring it back. Um, but he's not supposed to kill it. Just capture it and bring it back. The idea, Eurystheus' plan here is that uh, Artemis is going to get mad at Heracles for capturing her deer and um, punish Heracles. So he's trying to, to get the gods on his side. Uh, so it's a different kind of challenge. He can't kill the deer, but he's supposed to uh, figure out how to deal with Artemis at some point. So he tracks the deer for a year. He finally catches the, catches the deer. Um, oh, the deer runs faster than an arrow. So you can't shoot it with an arrow um, uh, from behind. And it runs so fast, you can't really get much of a shot for it. But Heracles spends an entire year getting a sideways shot at the arrow, at, uh, at the deer with his arrows. But he has to place the arrow very carefully because he, can't he doesn't want to damage the deer at all. So while the deer is running, the de he shoots the arrow right between the deer's le for four legs so that the, the deer trips over the arrow falls over and rolls over, and Heracles comes running really fast, grabs it, puts it in a net, slings it over his back, and uh, starts carrying it to Eurystheus. Um, when who shows up but Artemis? And Artemis says, what are you doing? And Heracles says, well, I'm trying to atone for the sin of murdering my children and my wife. And uh, Artemis says, oh, okay, just bring the deer back when you're finished. And so, yeah, that's how it goes. And so he takes the deer in and uh, gives it to Eurystheus and... Uh, then lets it go. Um, actually, uh, Eurystheus says, you must, you must give it to me. And uh, 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 Heracles says, OK. And he opens up the net, and the deer goes faster than the arrow out of the room. And he, Heracles says, oh, you didn't catch it fast enough. Sorry, Sorry about that. So, so Artemis gets her, gets her deer back. OK, the fourth labor. Oh, uh, just, just, just is, this is, is very interesting. The, um, a female deer with horns? With, I'm sorry, with, I keep saying horns. With antlers? There's only one kind of deer, female deer, that have antlers, hinds that have antlers, and that's reindeer, who don't live in Greece. These people are moving around an awful lot. They're learning stuff that goes on in other places and learning about other cultures and, and uh, all kinds of interesting things. Um, in fact, the, uh, the, um, the Greeks told stories about the Hyperboreans, who they said lived at, at the center of the at the, at the in this place to, to the north um, where the sun shone 24 hours a day. So unless they just simply made that up, they're referring to north of the Arctic Circle in the whichever time of winter, I guess, when the, when, or in the summer in the, for the North Pole when, um, when the sun shines 24 hours a day. Okay, somebody had passed through there when it's sun sh sh shone for 24 hours a day and so it's remembered as of a, a long-distance journey. Santa, Santa's reindeer, reindeer were all female. You, you can, you can, they do hook up reindeer to, to, to wagons and have them pull it, but you can't have two male deer pulling your wagon because they do the male deer this thing. Okay? You don't get very far in a wagon with male deers pull, deer pulling it. Okay? So you have to have female deers if you want to train them to pull, to pull your sleigh or your wagon. That's just a side note. That's not going to be on the test. It's just... It's just kind of cool. Anyway, there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot of little st stuff like that with the, these myths. Like, how, how do you learn about reindeer? Kind of, kind of interesting. Okay, the next one, the Aramanthian boar. You know what boars are living around here? We have a lot of them. I saw one running alongside the road just the other day, about a mile from my house. Uh, they're very dangerous, if you don't know. They're simply wild pigs. Okay, but they've bred themselves to be pretty big. They have tusks. Um, they can easily kill you, okay? Um, keep your dogs and yourself away from them, okay? They can do some serious damage. Um, well, this boar is a particularly dangerous boar, and um, uh, he, he's, he, again, this is one that he's not supposed to kill. He's supposed to trap it, keep it alive, and then somehow end up uh, bringing the boar back in a net. That's part of the labor, he, the contest. He has to figure out how to capture the boar, keep it alive, then bring it back in a net, which, of course, Heracles does. All right. And he uh, presents it to uh, Aristheus, and uh, Aristheus jumps in a great big, like, 55-gallon oil barrel of a jar 
to get away from the boar. Heracles is here. You wanted this boar, and here's Eurystheus hiding in his jar. Ah, no, don't get it. I don't want it. Um, so that's the Aramanthian boar. Um, yeah, that's Eurystheus's reaction. Okay, next labor. Very different. It's not about uh, killing or capturing animals, but cleaning up after animals. The Augean stables. They belong to a guy named Augeus, who's not very good at uh, barn maintenance, let's just say that. The horse stables have been, um, uh, have been, the horses' stables haven't been cleaned out in, I think, forever. Years and years and years and years and years. And so they're piled high with horse manure. And uh, 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 Heracles is given the job of cleaning out this, the stables in one day. He's got to, and there, these are hundreds of stalls, okay? He's got to go through and move all the poop out of the stalls, clean them up, get them all ready to go, and he has only one day to do it. So what he does is he takes a look at the, the area around him. Um, uh, he notices that there are two rivers who run nearby. And so he digs a trench to divert those two rivers so they run right through the stables. And in one or just a few minutes of river running through, it washes out the stables and um, it's all gone. Um, and he goes to Augeus, the king, and says, I want you to, to pay me for this. And the king says, no, I'm not going to pay you for it. And Heracles says, okay. This is something else about Heracles. A lot of people take advantage of him because at heart he's a nice guy. He's a good guy, and people tend to take advantage of him. Well, um, he comes back to uh, uh, Eurystheus, and Eurystheus doesn't accept this. He says that was cheating, and so he has to add on a, another labor onto the things that he does. The Augean stables is a something you'll run across in like political essays and things like that about things that are just a big, complete mess, okay, and and ha some some messy situation that has to be dealt with. Well, the sixth of these. There we go. The sixth of these labors is the Stymphalian birds. These are uh, mean, nasty, loud, flesh-eating birds, man-eating birds. Um, and Heracles kills them all. I mean, I'm not giving you all the details here. This isn't all that necessary. There you see Heracles with a sling um, shooting these birds down out of the sky. Well, these are the first six of the labors. The first six labors, labors one through six, take place in Greece. Seven, eight, and nine take place in other places outside of Greece. And then labors 10 through 12 take place in places you can't get to from here. Okay, kind of imaginary, uh, kind of imaginary places. So we'll move on to those that are outside of Greece. Number seven, um, Heracles goes to Crete to deal with the Cretan bull. This is the labor of the Cretan bull. Yes, this is the same bull that we talked about. I guess I was in class on Monday. The father of the Minotaur. This this bull, the one that Parsifal, the uh, king Minos's, Minos's wife, falls in love with. Yeah, the same bull, the father of the Minotaur um, that Theseus had killed. Well, the, the bull gets loose out of its pasture and is running around terrorizing everything. And um, so uh, uh, Minos uh, agrees to let Heracles take the bull and just get it out of Crete. It's caused too much trouble by now. He should have sacrificed it to the side in the first place and avoided all this problem. So now um, the bull is loose. And um, so it's um, Heracles captures it puts it on the ship, brings it back to Eurystheus, and uh, Eurystheus says, that's a nice bull, and that's that. Okay. The eighth of these labors, the horses of Diomedes. Now, I'm giving you too much detail here. Don't worry about these names here. They're just servants. So I was going to give you their names, but that's not really all that necessary. There are four horses who are owned by Diomedes. Domides is the king of somewhere. Don't worry about where, okay? These are four terrible horses. They um, eat human flesh. They eat people. In some stories, they breathe fire. Well, Heracles captures them. And in the process, one of his 
uh, companions is killed and eaten by the horses as they're trying to wrestle with these terrible horses. Um, and in re to take revenge, uh, Heracles kills Diomedes, who had kept these human-eating horses around for entertainment, um, and feeds them to his horses, to his own horses, feeds Diomedes to Diomedes' his own horses, which cures their insanity and um, lifts that insanity, and uh, now they're just normal horses, although they are pretty big and strong. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? What, what god is associated with insanity and madness? Dionysus and the tearing apart of humans and, uh, and spragmas and... Mine's gone blank. Homophagia, eating of the, the raw flesh. That's what the horses are doing. And somehow that when they do that to the Diomedes and they're released from... There's something about the Dionysian... There's something Dionysian here about, uh, about Heracles. And in fact, uh, there is a, a mystery religion about Heracles that develops very late in the story. Okay. Some kind of connection there to Dionysus. In fact, I'm going to write that down for next semester. I love this job. Sometimes you learn stuff in the middle of teaching. You're like, wait a second. I'm going to say that for next semester. Okay. Anyway, they, they calm down. But these horses, they are big and terribly strong. And so um, there are many uh, claims to their, de to their descendants. Um, some of their descendants will serve as horses that fight. Not The horses don't fight, but you know what I mean. In the Trojan War, Alexander, the great, the great favorite horse, Posephus, will be, Alexander will say it's a descendant of one of these horses, but Alexander talked crap all the time. Uh, the ninth of these, oh, uh, there's um, Diomedes being torn apart by the horses and being eaten. That's nice, okay. Um, it's called the girdle of Hippolyta. A girdle here, think about uh, like a wrestling belt or a uh, boxing belt, boxing championship belt, you know, uh, the big sign that you're, you're a champion, okay. It's worn by Queen Hippolyta. She's the queen of the Amazons. So Eurystheus um, uh, sends Heracles to uh, get this girdle away from Hippolyta. There are several stories about Heracles um, getting this, this belt, this sign of, of leadership. My favorite of these stories is that Hippolyta meets Heracles, and Heracles says, Eurystheus says, I need to take your girdle and take it back to him. And she says, okay, here it is. That's my favorite one. <laughs> some of these, some of these myths, you're like, <laughs> that's not my favorite. She, she says, okay. Yeah. It's like Artemis. Oh, okay. We'll just bring it back. Uh, the next of these, now we get to the, um, you can't get there from here stories. Number 10. These stories all take place in Spain, southern Spain. Now, Heracles lives in Greece, okay? Spain is over here, all right? The simplest thing outside of, of taking a boat, which Eurystheus won't let him do. He has to travel by land. You might think the simplest way would be to go this way, except there, there's the Alps up here, okay? And they're pretty difficult mountains to go through. So the easy way is to go across Turkey, down through where Israel is today, Syria is today, Israel is today, Egypt, across North Africa, and then just take the short trip across the Strait of Gibraltar into, into Spain. So these, these, um, these trips all deal with that back and forth of going to, uh, to Spain, but via North Africa. The uh, first of these, you can't get there from here, is, is the cattle of Geryon. Geryon is a, a, a giant. He's the grandson of Medusa. He has, get this, three heads, six arms, and six legs. He's like three, he's like a three-person person, okay? He's got three heads, six arms, and, and legs. He has a dog who's the brother of Cerberus. You remember who Cerberus is? Who's Cerberus? The Underworld Dog. Um, the Underworld Dog. When I was a kid, there was a cartoon, Underdog. I think it was cool. You know, I liked Underdog. Anyway, um, uh, this dog that uh, Geron, Geryon owns is a two-headed dog, okay? 
Um, and he has, oh, he's got a bunch of cattle. That's what the cattle thing is. He's got a bunch of cattle who are famed for their bloodline and their production of, of, of good meat and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, and, and he lives there in the south of Spain, or an island off the coast of the south of Spain. Um, so Heracles comes across where Turkey is today, down through here. He's traveling across Libya, and, um, and it's awfully hot. And he sees Helios up there in his, the sun, right, going across, making things hot. And so he's really ticked off. And so he takes one of his arrows and sh shoots at Helios. But the arrow from Helios's perspective just comes up and dips back down. And, and Helios just laughs and says, Heracles, you're so funny. Um, here's a golden floating chariot to, to float on the Mediterranean because it's not a boat, so you can use it. And so um, he gets on his floating a uh, golden chariot, or maybe just a pot. One story has it, just a pot. And he floats to uh, Geryon. Here you can see the fish and the squid in, in the water as he's um, floating all the way to Spain. Well, he gets to uh, um, uh, Geryon's island. He uh, kills Geryon. He kills the servants. He uh, herds up the cattle. Somehow he gets them off the island to the mainland. That part of the story is a big plot hole. Uh, but now Hera shows up again. She sends a gadfly to scatter the cows, cattle, and so the cattle all disperse. So it takes Heracles a whole year just to round up the cattle, and then once he's got them all rounded up, then he takes them back home to uh, Eurystheus, where he asks that they be sacrificed to Hera, which happens. The 11th of these labors. Oh, that's just, uh, sorry, I forgot I had this slide. Here we have um, the cattle over here. Here's Athena. You may be able to make out Athena there. She's got a spear to help um, uh, Ulysses and Heracles in case he needs it. And here's Heracles, and here is uh, Geryon. You see he's got the three heads and all his hands, and you can't really see, but there are three legs coming out here next to each other there. Anyway, we've run across this one before, the apples of the Hesperi, Hesper, Hes, Hesperides. Hesperides, what am I trying to say? Hesperides. The Hesperides are nymphs who live in the west, and by that we mean right to, back to this area, to the extent of the Mediterranean world, somewhere over in this part of the world. Hesper is the Greek word that means e, uh, west, sorry. It comes from an old uh, Indo-European root that means west. It's on this trip that Heracles goes a little bit wide when he travels through Turkey. Goes a little bit wide, he ends up over here, and that's where he meets Prometheus, who is chained to that mountain with, a, with the eagle that eats his liver every day. He shoots the eagle, kills the eagle, uh, frees Ulysses somehow, and uh, frees um, Prometheus somehow then continues on his trip. I mentioned that as a little sidelight in an earlier lecture. Um, but this is the one where uh, he goes, and we, we saw a video where, uh, of Heracles being the trickster. He plays the trick on Atlas. Um, he, he, Heracles holds the earth for a while while, while, Her while Atlas goes away, and then Atlas comes back and, and, uh, and, and says, yeah, you just stay here holding the earth for all of eternity. And Heracles says, okay, but can you just take it back for a minute so I can just scratch my back and ha Atlas does and Heracles runs away. Um, but eventually he gets to the, um, the uh, to get the, to the apples. On the way back he runs into a guy named Antaeus. I don't think I even have that on a, a slide. It's not a big deal. But he's a, a gi another giant who lives in Libya. He's the son of Poseidon and Gaia. Gaia finally shows up again. She's been around forever. But Poseidon has um, a child with his grandmother, I guess. His grandmother. Yeah, his grandmother, uh, Gaia. And um, he's an invincible wrestler. Everybody who comes by that he meets, he challenges them to a wrestling match, and he wrestles them. And as long as he is in contact with the ground, he can't be killed. As long as he's in contact with the earth, his mother, he can't be killed. And he's built a temple to his father, Poseidon, out of the skulls of the people he's killed wrestling. So this is a lot of people, all right? And he challenges Heracles to a wrestling match. Heracles knows that he can't grapple with him, you know, 
So Heracles gets a hold of him, lifts him off the earth, and so he's separated from his mother, and then just bears hugs him, to, bear hug, bears hugs, bear hugs him to death. That's how he kills um, that guy. There are all kind of these minor adventures as he travels around. The last of the uh, labors is to capture Cerberus, the three-headed dog of Hades. So Heracles has to make a catabas. He has to go down to the underworld. <coughs> we aren't given a lot of details about how he does this, but he goes into the underworld and then he comes out again, this time with Cerberus. He's brought Cerberus out of the underworld. And again, we don't have a lot of the details there. That's how a mystery religion develops around Heracles. See, he's able to enter the underworld and then, then make his way out. Yeah, Kaylin. Um, did I miss which other labor that he get instructed? Um, I'll give you give it to you at the end. Okay. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll I'll make sure we get caught up. And here you see Eurystheus getting more use out of this water jug, hiding here. Let's see, which one was not, it's off the, oh, the, um, the Hydra. The Hydra was instructed? Yeah. Wow. Because he had help from his nephew. Oh, yeah. Slipped my mind. I didn't know if I missed it. Yeah. 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 I should have underlined it when we went through. So, uh, there's Cerberus, he's, um, presented to Eurystheus, and now the, uh, the um, labors are over, and he's atoned for the murder of his wife and kids. Well, while he's down in um, the underworld, um, uh, he runs into somebody, I forget even who it was, who says, um, you know, when you, when you finish atoning for the murder of your wife and you want to get married again, uh, you ought to look up my sister. Her name is Dianyra. Isn't that a pretty name, Dianyra? In Greek, it means husband killer. Okay. To those of you watching at home, if there are any of you young gentlemen who have a friend who tries to m match you up with a sister whose name is husband killer, not a good idea. Not a good idea. Well, he meets her. He looks her up after he gets done with his, with his, um, with his uh, uh, travels. Um, and they hit, they hit it off very nicely. Uh, they, they get married. Okay. Um, they are they're going off on their honeymoon, and they come to a river. There's a centaur standing at the river, and the centaur, whose name is Nessus, I'll give you that name in just a second on the screen. It's not going to be terribly important anyway when I do. Um, says, "Hey Heracles, I'll I'll carry your bride across the the river." And Heracles says, "Okay," even though Heracles was certainly strong enough to carry his wife across the river. Well. Uh, the centaur, who's half horse and half man, right? You know who, what centaurs are. Uh, carries her to the other side of the river and then begins to sexually assault his wife. Yeah, horrible story. And so uh, Heracles, from the other side of the river, draws his bow and arrow, f sees what's going on, and shoots the centaur. While the centaur is dying, he says to um, Dianyra, um, you know, before I die, you need to take some of my blood and put it in a little bottle and keep it. And um, because uh, there'll come a time when, when Heracles is going to be unfaithful to you. And uh, when, when you get really, really, really concerned about this, you need to, to, to give him this, this blood somehow, and it will, uh, it, will, it will unite him to you forever. Okay. And uh, it'll really heat up your love life. And so, um, and so she does. She takes a little bottle of the centaur's blood and then Nessus. Uh, uh, dies. And there we see a depiction of um, Heracles there with the club, not a bow and arrow, but you got to fit him into the, the same scene, right? And the centaur and Dionyra. Now, what the centaur and what Dionyra doesn't realize is that the arrows that Heracles carries are poisonous, right? And so when the poison entered the centaur's bloodstream, all of his blood got poisoned, so he's given Dionyra a little poison, bottle of poison, yeah, poison blood. Well, um, life settles down a little bit for Heracles, but there's one little adventure left, 
And uh, he says, I, I need to go off on one more adventure. And so he goes to partake in an archery contest in a city called Trachis. Don't even worry about that name either. It's just a place I'll be talking about. So um, he goes to participate in this con archery contest. The king of the city, the king of Trachis, has a beautiful daughter, Ioli. And the king of, of Trachis says, um, the winner of this contest can have, um, can, can, can have my wife as, e I have my daughter as either a wife or if he's already married, uh, he can have her as a concubine. Some kind of dad here. Again, we got Father of the Year award going on. Okay, um, whoever whoever wins can have my wife, have my daughter, either as a wife or a concubine. And so Heracles participates in the con in the contest. Um, he wins, of course, because he has arrows that never miss, which is kind of why bother entering a contest with him. But, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but so he goes to the, the king and says, "Well, I want Ioli as my concubine," and the king says, "No." Well, there's a big fuss, and somehow one of uh, somehow Ioli's brother is killed in the melee. If you're keeping track, he probably didn't do anything wrong. He's probably a nice guy who just gets killed. He probably plays no role in the story at all, other than to be a mur another murder victim. Well, now Heracles has to atone for another, for yet another murder. So he goes back to the oracle. The oracle says he has to sell himself into slavery for a year. And so he goes to a, um, a slave market, puts himself up for auction as a slave. He's won by a queen, Queen Omphali. who makes Heracles dress like a lady and clean his, her house. Yeah, that's it. You, make, you can see Heracles in like a French maid outfit, yeah, exactly. running around dusting everything. I don't know. Heracles thought it was a lot of fun. What can I say? Sometimes you just got to say, what can you say? Well, he does a year with Queen on Folly, and so he's happy to be done with that job. And he decides he, he still wants Ioli. And so he goes back to Trachis to uh, lay siege to the city until he's given Ioli as his concubine. It's now that Dionyra starts to get a little nervous. Okay. And so she sends, she packs up uh, Heracles' favorite cloak and puts it in a box and um, sends it to him and writes a note saying, um, she puts the, she, she writes them, she puts some of that, uh, centaur's blood on the on the cloak on the inside of the cloak, okay, and sends it to Her <coughs> Heracles. <coughs> excuse me. Sends it. To, excuse me. <coughs> sends it to Heracles in a box, and it, it says, "Dear Heracles, here's your favorite cloak. I hope it keeps you warm. Um, love, husband killer." He puts he puts he puts on the cloak. And uh, immediately he starts to sweat, and it gets very, very, very hot. And uh, he begins to, to get hotter and hotter and hotter. He realizes that he's going to die. So he very quickly builds himself a funeral pyre to dispose of his body. He climbs up on top of it, and he, he says, he orders, um, or he asks everybody in, around him to light the funeral pyre, to kill him so that he'll, his body will be disposed of properly. Nobody wants to do it, but finally one guy comes up to do it, and Heracles says, you can have my bow and arrow, bow and arrows, for lighting the funeral pyre. That shows up later in one of the stories. And so um, Heracles dies. His, when he dies, his, he's split into two. His mortal body goes to the underworld, and his immortal part, whatever, immortal part, whatever, goes to, um, uh, to, to Mount Olympus where he kind of hangs out there on Mount Olympus. Where he becomes a god, of course. Um, he gets married to Hebe, who's the goddess of youth. She's another one of those daughters of Zeus that I haven't talked about. She's the daughter of Zeus and Hera, but she's, I mentioned her once to you, but she's not terribly important. But she is the, the daughter of, of the goddess of, of youthful beauty, so that's something. Um, so all of Heracles' suffering is over. 
and all your suffering listening to the stories is over.